Hey everyone, it's Savannah from the Elmo Rival. I'm here with Kim Hoffman. Kim, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi guys, like Savannah said, my name is Kim here. Um, we're so excited to just be here for this podcast and just to get to, we have actually a very special guest yes. today speaking with us and um, I'll actually hand this over to Savannah to introduce <laughs> her. Yeah, so as I said, I'm Savannah. I've been with LM Arrival since 2016 um, and as Kim stated, we're here with Marina Prakash, who is our pastor's wife. She's much more than our pastor's mm-hmm. wife, actually, though. She is a spiritual mother to us. Um, she's an encourager to us. Yes. She is our coach. She's the heart of our mission. Um, she's a homemaker. She is a nurse. She's actually been cer- a certified nurse in three different countries, <laughs> including our nation, America. Mm. Um, she is a champion for a life. She has a heart for the youth. Um, she's a lie breaker. She's a mm. kingdom seeker. Um, She's just an amazing woman of God and someone who I know has actually impacted Kim and I's lives so much. She's known Kim and I since we were teenagers. So so Mm -hmm. since I was 19 and Kim, how old were you? I was 17 when I first met Marina. Yeah. So she's been an amazing, an amazing resource, an amazing, you know, God given mother to us as we've grown in this Mm -hmm. faith. And so we're just really excited uh, to be with you today. We call her affectionately mommy. Mommy, Um, So you will probably hear us say mommy (laughs) rather than Marina. That is just our term of endearment for her. It's our love for her uh, because she really is. I know in India or in Hindi, I should say that means aunt, Mm -hmm. but to us, it definitely means mom. Um, So we're just excited to be with you and chat with you. And how would you introduce yourself? Well, thank you so much. <laughs> and excuse my hoarse voice because that's not my normal. Mm-hmm. It's just post some upper respiratory infection. How would I introduce myself? Man, it's so humbling to hear uh, what all you said. And I'm looking back and it's so kind of you to say those um, kind words. And life just keep happening and you mm-hmm. do not realize what... Uh, all you do. Mm, so I'm yeah. just so humbled to be here, so thankful, and so thankful for both of you. And uh, you know that I connect with you guys in a very special way for how many years mm. doing life together, I would say. So yeah. thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, Kim, how many years? 10 years? It's been about 10 years. Ten yeah. Years. It's crazy to think yeah. about. Ten I years. know. And Savannah with you, five years? Six years. Six years. Yeah. 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 And that itself speaks something. Yeah. Because a uh, very uh, longevity relationship, six and uh, 10, it says something. So I'm so grateful uh, to be here. And uh, I'm. Whatever you have questions, what you want me to clarify and reflect and let God be glorified in all of those things and through our stories. Yeah. 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 So one thing that I was reflecting on, Mommy, is like your experience, your um, life, the way that God has brought you up. Even Mm. I think it's amazing when I think about you being born and raised in India in a Christian home, mm. how, how probably that <laughs> unlikely that is, right? For for it to be in India where there's like Hinduism, there's Buddhism mm. and how your parents were Christians and you grew up and you've what you've shared with us and reflected on us is you had a very loving, nurturing childhood. Um, could you explain like what it was like? How was your relationship with your mother? How was your relationship with your father? What was your perception of their marriage uh, growing up? Yeah, thank you so much, Savannah, uh, for this question. Yeah, it's um, probably I have to go back and reflect all those, but it's so easy because you lived that life, you know? Mm. Yeah, I was uh, raised in India. And India is basically a very Hindu-dominated country. And uh, my father was a second-generation Muslim. Mm, So if even their name seems very different because they are Muslim names. My father's name was Nazar, which is a very uh, Muslim name, actually. So because the generation to generation, these names were continued. And my mom's name was Afia, 
and Afia is another Muslim name. So both my parents came from second generation. Mm. And so they knew one thing, that their relationship with Jesus and Christianity was so precious to them because mm. of how they came from the second generation. So when uh, I am seventh of eight siblings and uh, fourth sisters, and I just have a younger brother, had younger brother. So we two were the youngest and we were very close. So already you had, you know, the eldest sibling. They were, so they were teenagers or grown up. They were in high schools and so some of them are working. So we were kind of, you know, so loved uh, mm -hmm. by not only our parents, but also siblings, you know, because mm -hmm. siblings land up taking care of you. Um, and so very, very connected, very together. The other thing, uh, those days, uh, even last night I was talking to Ajay, we didn't have television even for so long in our mm. home. There was no phones. Mm. There was just one radio that my mom will put up in the morning to hear, you know, a Christian radio, to hear some gospel music and some message. That's all we had. And um, so we're very close-knit family. My parents, having eight children, they were too busy taking care of them. My mom was a homemaker. She uh, didn't go for work because she had these children to take care. And my dad was the one who was a breadwinner. He, he worked. And he was in the military. He was, you know, he was a veteran. And after he got retired from there, he still continued to work. And um, they hardly had any time to... I haven't seen them arguing much, mm. really. Mm. And my mother had her own role, her own set routine, breakfast, lunches, laundry. And, you know, she was always busy with those things. My dad will come from work and then he would just spend some time with us. But we grew up watching and listening uh, sports. That was mm. our entertainment in the evening. My father, when we had a radio, would listen to sports. And then we will also, when we, black and white TV, we came. I remember my father got first TV because it was a World Hockey Cup. And, uh, and we were so excited, black and white TV. So that was kind of a home growing up, uh, normal activities. But when it comes to our faith, my father was not like, uh, you know, all out radical Christian or, mm -hmm. you know, preaching all the time, talking all the time. He was just living on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we saw a lot of characters in him. He was a calm. I haven't ever seen him yelling, screaming, you know, at mm -hmm. us or or um, uh, on my mom. And it was just a busy, busy household. And we, uh, my elder sibling helped one another. But on the other side, when it goes to faith, my mom was a very, like, openly professing to be very strong believer. Mm -hmm. The only thing in our home was a radio. And the radio, when I used to get up, I would only hear a gospel music going on, those, you know, those hymns. And then there was a preacher who will preach. That's how was my morning routine before going to school. And my mom would go to church every Sunday. My father sometime, he will miss here and there, you know. He didn't believe going every Sunday. Mm -hmm. But my mom would not uh, miss any Sunday. And then... Uh, whatever uh, budget my dad will give, I would see my mom always asking her to us to write on the envelope because she was such a tither. Mm -hmm. Whatever m budget my dad would give her because she didn't go for work, she didn't earn money, but my father would give her a budget. And I, one thing I remember every Sunday, no matter what, uh, you know, 
there was there will be an envelope and there will be a tithe and she would uh, have a weekly taken off and so many times sometimes we were you know inquisitive that where is the money so <laughs> we would go look into the bible because there is will be an envelope in the bible and there is <laughs> money and that's her tithing that mm. these are the things that you know uh, was very i just saw her doing uh, and very respectful, mm-hmm. also very, very simple mm-hmm. person, and uh, taught us. Um, now I know a lot of characteristics of mine are like my mom. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize for so many years because I'm doing, you know, nursing because my mom was not a nurse, so I saw myself just a nurse. But when I think of how the nurturing nature, like if somebody comes to my house, I first thing I think of food. That's my <laughs> yeah. mom, right? You know, and even no matter what, it's so easy to order food. But my mom would always cook for us. So mm. my uh, gesture for love is that if I cook for somebody mm. food, that's my uh, very, uh, you know, big response to loving somebody. And also just um, a homemaker. And now I realize myself that there is a lot of these characteristics. And she was a grandma. She loved children. And I love children. And um, the home that we grew up was uh, just a t- together. We were together and we were so, we didn't have a lot. I wouldn't consider we were very rich or we were even just middle class family. We had enough on a day-to-day basis, but we didn't have too much, mm-hmm. you know. But God, uh, uh, you know, had provided all I know that we had. And we had a house that my dad, when he was retired from being a veteran, they bought a house. We were not living on a rented house. So we owned a house. So that helped us a lot that we can, till today, can call that um, our home mm-hmm. in India. Uh-huh. So that's a little bit of uh, home atmosphere and... Um, my dad never wanted me to be influenced by Hinduism mm-hmm. or Islam or any other or Sikhism. His, he was so protective that he, I went to a Christian school till grade seven. Then I went to a residential school because it was Christian. Mm. And then I went to college and that was a Christian college. So I never studied in a public school because... Uh, that was one of my dad's greatest desire for me to live uh, and and be educated in a Christian uh, organization. So I never, ever was exposed to public school. And that is these organizations where I went, even my BSN four years program, also I did in a Christian organization. So basically my... my, uh, real grounding that I can't imagine life without church. I can't Mm -hmm. uh, imagine my life not reading the word. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't imagine my life uh, without going to, you know, go to church or youth group or some Bible study. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit of um, faith and my Christian background from home. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, it's really amazing to hear because... What what you grew up in your home, like n- mm-hmm. not seeing your family fight, your parents fight, having so much love. It's very countercultural to what we experience yeah. in America. And I'm mm-hmm. sure actually in, in many homes across the world, like, I mean, sin is everywhere yeah. and, and it's, um, it's ruining our homes. It's mm-hmm. distorting our homes. So I just really want to thank you so much for sharing that. And it's amazing to also hear that so many of the values that your parents had their generosity, their obedience mm-hmm. to God, their faithfulness to God, and even the little things, um, their love for, you know, authenticity, like such as home cooking and, and having a good home and being a good steward of home is something that you carry on today. And yeah. I know that that's something that's impacted you now, but it also deeply impacted you as a teenager, right? And something that you say um, mm-hmm. all the time is that the choices that we make between the ages of 18 to 25 are the choices that impact us for the rest of our lives. Like they're the most important. Mm -hmm. So can you share about 
you know, what were some of the choices that you had to make as an 18 to 25 year old Mm -hmm. in this crazy world um, that impacted you till today? Yeah. First of all, I want to go back. You know, now I'm thinking, um, see, there's one way that we were protected because we have a big family, eight siblings. My parents had no time to fight with one another. (laughs) You know, really, I'm just thinking. And uh, because for having eight children Mm. living in one house and you have two parents and there was enough of house chores, we didn't have anybody else to help. So throughout the day, the routine was somebody else gone for school, somebody else gone for college, somebody else coming back. So my mom... Like, day used to be so busy, and that's same with my father. He had only this much time when he comes in the home, you know. So I now miss that, that we were mm. big family, yeah. lived in one house, and there is so much work to be done on a routine basis, right. cooking, cleaning, laundry, and the cycle goes on. So we didn't, we had assignments to do at home. So it was a blessing in one way. Now I think yeah, so. Right? <laughs> they didn't yeah. have time <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to true. fight or argue a lot. And I'm sure that they had struggles. Probably they had a lot of struggles, but probably they just, you know, uh, discuss within one. one mm-hmm. I remember seeing them sometime talking with one another, but they were never loud. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure that they did, but we didn't come to know. I, at least, we were the youngest, so we probably didn't come to know a lot. Of right. Their, you know, yeah. picking your battles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So now your question, uh, the second question was um, 18 to 25. Yes, absolutely. You know, that's why we are also very passionate mm-hmm. for this generation mm. of this age group also mm. because it's so true. It's so true because by the time you are 18, you're just figuring out your life, yeah. your school, your college. Those days probably we didn't have phones, we didn't have any internet, we didn't have anything, no YouTube videos, no TV, not much of this. So it was just study, study, study. And, you know, it was in India especially, you know, it's a very educational-oriented mm. country. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure for us to do good in school and uh, find a career for yourself, get good jobs. These things are basic to whether you're Christian, whether you're non-Christian, whatever is your faith. But these are the very cultural basics. So there was a lot of pressure on me on, also on the same um, you know, my dad used to say, no, you make sure what you want to do, you know, and make sure that you make right choices. He never pressured me, but there's one one choice that he was very careful. He, that was about my marriage. He mm. always wanted what kind of guy I will get attached to. This was the only concern that he was always worried about. Uh, you know, if I fall in love with a guy, who that guy would be. So he has ingrained in me that you make sure you make that choice very carefully. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, he expressed his desire. He said, I know that I can't impose any desire of mine, but I would prefer, I pray that if you ever find a man or a guy or a boy in your life, it, he will be Christian. Mm-hmm. And he would love Jesus. That's the (laughs) only one advice I remember him, you know, talking about. So the reason I say that 18 to 25 is so important, because very, think about, you've just finished high school, right? Mm -hmm. And what kind of, like, do you want to go college? What kind of major do you want to choose? Okay. So it's important that you choose your major Think what you are desiring to do. Rather, every two hour years, keep changing right. your majors and you waste a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. That my father was very picky about it. And he, then four years, whether you do graduate degree of any kind or, or post-graduation, and then uh, those days, in, uh, I'm a 60s born. I'm a 64 born, right? So those days, it was very important that you find a job and then, um, you know, marry. Mm-hmm. And you, these are the very specific decisions. Like if you're 18 and then 
till 22, mm -hmm. you do <clears throat> your degree of some kind, and by then you have, you know, a relationship, and then if you have a relationship, in our, those days in our families didn't believe in hanging around for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can get married. So it was pretty straight and pretty simple. I really feel bad that how 22, 21st century, it's so complicated. Yeah. Mm. It's so hard to um, make these choices because life becomes so complicated even by the time you complete high school. And uh, that, that in our time, that innocence was maintained. Mm. And then, can you imagine the, all these decisions about your college and then about your job, about what kind of career, is by basically done by 2024. Yeah. five or 26 and then by now you know the job you what kind of job you're doing mm -hmm. what kind of person you're gonna marry or mm -hmm. live with the relationship is established and you know and you know that rest of after 25 it will matter what kind of job you did what kind of education you did what kind of career you chose for yourself mm -hmm. what kind of relationship you chose for yourself the, because the rest of your life, are you are basically just struggling to go through for what the choices you made. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. it's so important, though, whatever choices you made during at that time impacted your rest of your life. Because whom you marry, whom you, uh, you know, have relationship, that impacts. Yeah. Right. What kind of jobs you do, your financial stability depends Mm -hmm. um, and rest of your life. So basically, you are, you know, toggling between the impact of those choices that you made from um, seven years of your life. Right. I don't know if it makes sense, but no, it does. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, it's so true, and it, we don't really see that right now a yeah. lot at all. Like, there's a there's a lack of care. I mm. think in this present generation, like they yeah. don't. They're living day to day. Like they're yep, not a, thinking they're of the, the future. Like I know that that's, I mean, that's what I was, right? I was just trying to get by day to day. I wasn't thinking mm -hmm. about the future. I wasn't thinking because I don't think a lot of, I don't think a lot of our, the youth understands the weight of life. Like mm -hmm. it's not just a day to day yeah. basis. Like God has given you, he's fashioned you, he's formed you, he's given you a purpose yeah. in life. And there's so much more to life than living from day to day. Mm -hmm. And that is one reason, because I think, you know, sometimes people think that if you've gone through the worst of worst, then you can help somebody. Mm. My, my situation was a little different. I think for me, it was smooth. It, not that it was, you always have challenges of right. your own kind. Yeah. You don't have enough. You have to just, you know, student or whatever, the pressure of studies. The pressure of studies, the pressure of school. It's a different kind of battles, right? Different kind of battles. But I, now when I look back, it was still so simple. Mm -hmm. But now it's so difficult. Yeah. So now I feel my calling when I meet young people of this age group. At every single moment, I'm thinking they can also... Uh, make their life easy. So that's mm -hmm. why the lot of mentoring, when you, when I met you, you were 16 or 17. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So the, um, when I met you, Savannah, you were 19. Yeah. And uh, so whenever I see a young life, I'm just thinking, what can we do to mentor them, mm. to facilitate them? Yeah. One thing to help them to have their deeper relationship with Jesus. Right. The second step goes, how can you make those choices that, that you don't have too much to regret? Mm -hmm. How can you make choices in such a way that you don't have to deal too much of a negative impact of those choices? Yeah. How can you minimize damage? Yeah. And I feel, I feel a little bit of mentoring, a little bit of discipleship, a little bit of coaching, a little bit of uh, maneuvering here and there. It does help you because then later... You just minimize the damage of those choices. So I'm true. not so sure if I'm making sense, no, you but are. so yeah. that's what I'm very passionate about. Yeah, mm. it's a lifelong yeah. impact. 
All right, that was going to go into actually uh, another question I had for you before I let Kimmy ask some questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we we just as we just discussed, like your heart is for the youth. Your heart yeah, is absolutely. for you see you see their lives, right? Mm-hmm. You don't see it just from day to day. Like you see the entirety of their lives, yep. even if they're only seeing it day to day. You mm-hmm. see the purpose that God's given to them. You see that the decisions that they're making now could have mm-hmm. very treacherous impacts later. Mm-hmm. So you see all of that. And, um, you know, you, you and, you and pastor, you've committed yourselves to being father to a father and a mother to those who have never experienced the wholeness of a home. Mm. They've never experienced some on our team even have never experienced, um, a mother, the the Mm. lovingness of a mother, the Mm. kindness of a mother, the nurturing of a mother. Some have never experienced the protectiveness of a father, Mm. like, you know, your father was to you, the wisdom that comes from having those God-given relationships. Um, So um, what you do as a mother is you steward godly relationships with those you disciple and nurture, Um, so one question is, you know, how do your close, sorry, how do our close personal relationships either hinder or facilitate our revival, our Mm. relationships with God? Yeah. So like, for example, because I'm a very practical day to day life person, um, like think about Kim when we met. Okay, mm-hmm. you were just. Uh, I even attended your high school graduation. Yeah, I remember <laughs> wow. that. We were crazy. shouting. Yes. Uh, so we were there even for your graduation. And if you think about we, what kind of conversation you started to come to church, mm-hmm. and then in between you expressed the desire. We were having Bible study, and then you started to meet me. You know. Um, off and on in between and then very regularly. So during that time when we were meeting one-on-one and, uh, you know, you would ask me for any kind of counsel on any Mm -hmm. issue, you will also ask a lot of questions about God, perspective of God, you know, you wanted to know the Word of God more. But if I have to sum up, what was those now conversation literally most of the conversation was, uh, what kind of education do you want for that? Do you want or not? Mm-hmm. You know, I know you per- try to pursue nursing. You try to, be, and sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we, we also talked about different kind of jobs that you were doing. Mm-hmm. And we prayed a lot of intervention in the job, in those jobs. And then the third question that we talked about was what kind of relationship. And then you fell in love with Austin. And then we were maneuvering, uh, you know, in between just regularly, routinely talking about how this relationship can be uh, Mm -hmm. God-centered so that it doesn't go in the negative direction. So so all these years, the conversations was rotated around this only. Number one was relationship with God, understanding yep. the word of God more, understanding and also your calling mm-hmm. and uh, jobs, career. Mm-hmm. And then over a period of time, you got married. Then mm-hmm. we started to talk about marriage, mm-hmm. what marriage is, you know, a yeah. godly-based marriage. How can you have that relationship with us? So that, that is really life. Yeah, and doing mm-hmm. life you, together. Yeah, that's that that that's all the conversation I remember in ten years. Mm-hmm. And then you became mom, and then and and the next conversation, how to be a mom. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it was so simple. It was not even a, It was not something that you had to conjure. Mm-hmm. It's so, so natural. It mm-hmm. flew uh, on a da- daily basis. The biggest thing also in this was that you trusted. Mm. You know, and same thing, Savannah. Yeah. If you were 19 year old and we started to meet uh, off and on, and then we started to meet routinely, mm-hmm. and uh, every decision, so our yeah. choices has so much impact on our life. Yeah. And can and then all I had to walk through. Okay, now this job, second this job. Now you want to progress from this job to another job. Mm-hmm. So is this God's will for my life? Is this what I can do? Can I not do this? And then, then again, you met Colton. And yeah. then how this 
relationship is going to forward mm. is this god is this relationship from god and how can this be relationship god centered how can then marriage took place then how can you know this marriage be a godly marriage i mean it's so natural flow of life yeah, mm. yeah. i don't think so it changes with anybody somebody else yeah. if somebody when i meet people is the same question either yeah. they are in bad relationship mm-hmm. and they're telling you the toxicity of a relationship and then so again one choice and then or you are in a bad job that is mm-hmm. causing you so much stress and um then it's just on did or financial burdens because we are not good steward of um our finances mm-hmm. these things are just so normal flow of life yeah mm-hmm. yeah so now your question is how did it impact mm-hmm. how did it it impact my life or how do you because the role that you take on is like you are not just she's not just a pastor's, she's a pastor's wife. wife you're not just see you sunday like yeah. you have the closeness of our relationships with you is you know daughter to mother or uh this disciple or to disciple yeah like mentor to, to yeah mentee. mentor to mentee mm-hmm. so how and some advice that you've given throughout our lives that i am always thinking of is you know maintaining those god centered mm. relationships having those god centered relationships why is that so important and how do our relationships impact or hinder our own personal revival mm. yeah so as i said for me i don't know i'm a very simple person yeah. and uh for me the, these are the normal things of life so when mm. you meet somebody these are the questions that you ask and i have also been through with so many people mm-hmm. it was so hard for them to understand god because mm. they had so many difficulties they can't understand god when they are living in a toxic relationship mm-hmm. i've gone through with people also you know when somebody is in a bad relationship it's difficult to get out is difficult to stay mm-hmm. so i've also had people in my life that i went through life with them that um you know there's so much toxicity in their life and in that all they are wrapped up with their issues of life that it is so hard for them to even see god's heart yeah so that is why again so you help somebody to make the choice on, in the first place so how does it help uh, for a revival in your own life because even if you are going through a tough time a toxic relationship bad relationship abusive relationship and uh, when what i in my good conscious will always give somebody a counsel it's a hard thing to mm. do but the accountability is that you are accountable to god you have to mm, think yeah. me and if god is going to speak to this person what would god say to mm. this person and sometime it come across as a tough love but you got to say that you just mm. got to speak that truth because you know that out after speaking that truth is going to heal that person yeah. Yeah. and uh, it's up to them how they're going to take your counsel but on the other hand to go through with them to go through with life when they can't even understand god let mm. me be like much more simpler mm, in explaining yeah. go through some with somebody and sometimes they have family difficulty they come from such a broken home yeah. that they struggle at home there is addictions in the home like a, there is addictions of drugs at home there's mm. a, addictions of alcoholism at home uh, that's been my life like going through with people and there's a domestic violence in mm-hmm. homes there is abuse in home so you just though that is the time when they don't understand but you continue to bring them to the reality of god even if they don't understand at that time but one thing i have experienced in my life even in those difficult situation you continue to go through with them in those difficult times no matter what that godly conversations it gives them comfort mm. because it is a godly 
godly um, conversation and it's everything based on the word of God. It's based based from the heart of God. Mm. So no matter what, when they go back, they really think, man, no matter what, I don't know, but this makes sense. Mm. I feel better. This makes me feel at peace, even if it's not making sense. And that's a proof that that is a power of God. And then they want more of this. They want Mm. more of this. And then over period of time, you know, then God starts to heal. God starts to bring freedom. And that, because you help them to see God step by step, step by step, step by step. And a time come when they do feel that clarity. They do genuinely start to feel the move of God. They Mm -hmm. genuinely start to feel that healing of God. Mm -hmm. Genuinely start to feel the touch of God. And then that's called revival. Revival doesn't happen just with one yeah. moment. Mm. Revival is a process. Yes. Step by step, step by one one year, one kind of feeling. Second year, another kind of feeling. Another six month, another kind of um yeah, you know, freedom. And then, you know, when it's just like let me share one example. If you taste something, you know, if you taste a fruit sometime, you have never tasted it before. And I say, oh, man, I like it. It's so delicious. What are you going to do? You're going to hunt and you're going to go yeah. find <laughs> to the sh- store where you can find that fruit. So mm. I'm going to try this again. I'm going to try this again. And next time, and then you'd become dependent on that mm. because you love it so much because, mm. you know, that, then that becomes your most favorite fruit so ever. Yeah. I think with God is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to taste him and you say, this looks something nice. Mm-hmm. There's peace in this. There's, there's some something there. And then you want more. And then you want more. And then you want more. And then you become at that point where you can't live without reading that word, without mm-hmm. praying, yeah. and without that fellowship, without worshiping. And, and there's one time that come you become so dependent on, on your own worship. You start dependent on your own relationship with God. And then God start to free you. And that's mm-hmm. called revival. Yeah. Mm. I don't know yeah. if I, it makes that sense. Makes but yeah. total Perfect sense. sense. Yeah. 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 And that, that, that's called. So these just even walking through, and then this is a process. And that process need time Mm -hmm. and it need endurance and it needs even continued like sometimes for example savannah i didn't have to do anything all i have to do you let you cry right you know because it's not making any sense at that time so this personal revival is the most beautiful experience beautiful Mm -hmm. experience um anybody can have and that's why my, uh, that's why we, we're doing what we are doing because I would do nothing else other than this because once a life has experienced personal revival, then they become so passionate, they know now what they have to do for others. Yeah, mm. that's so true. Wow. So it just flows. It's a continual flow. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, mm. that's amazing. Thank you, Mommy. Then as we we get got into a serious conversation. <laughs> I, know. I love it so much. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I'll go ahead and ask a question since yes, we're you. talking here about, you know, how mommy has taken that role of spiritual mother and how she's impacted like Savannah and my life so much. Mm-hmm. So um, as we were saying, many of us call her mommy, and um, just to ask here can you share a little bit about some of the pain you experience a lot of people I know you've said this a lot during um whenever you're sharing your testimony but if you can share a little bit about the pain you experienced when you didn't get to experience the fruit of the womb and how God gave you a promise and answered it through so many spiritual children oh yeah so this uh, (coughs) sorry you're okay This is absolutely um, a very God story. Mm-hmm. I was not ready for it. I had no idea 
But all I know, again, those 18 to 25, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that time period, all I knew is I, when I was 18 um, and I was, uh, I, I did go to College of Nursing to do my BSN program. So for four years, um, I met my spiritual mom over there. She was a director of uh, Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So we had about 120 children and I, I, she, 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 you know, she used to help me. Uh, she, she, she was mentoring me and she, she saw something in me always. She would invite me to her house and uh, she was very burdened about my life and she was always concerned that I don't go in the wrong direction. So, uh, you know, she started to take a lot of interest in my life. And then she did offer that I should be, I should teach uh, one of the classes mm. with her in the Sunday school. So I had one class and I had about 30, 35 children that I taught for four years. And every Sunday, uh, would do, take the Sunday school classes and then go to church and come home. And she was our director. And in order to next week facilitate Sunday school, we will talk throughout the week in between, you know. So I fell in love with children at that time so much because I, no matter what kind of exam or, you know, I had next day, I would still be there every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I would, I don't remember any time missing, uh, not teaching Sunday school. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with children that, that age group so much that I was saying, I used to say that, oh, when I get married, I'm going to have, you know, four children, three children. And I used to dream about having children. And mm -hmm. I thought that, I thought that I was so simple. I thought it's kind of mandatory. And mm. that's how, how life is. And yeah. that's how I'm going to get married. I will have home. I'll have four children. And, and I will be mom. Yeah. Not knowing that it can happen. or it, That was not even an option for me, mm. right? This is how set, the, set plan in my head. So Ajay and I got married. And when we went to the Middle East, after <clears throat> within a one year of our marriage... And um, then second year we were together and third year we were together.